camera stores, there wasn't a day that I would sit back and say to myself, man, I want to quit. I can't do this anymore. It makes a big difference if you're doing something you love. Um, you know, I, I loved what I did. I, I didn't love my first career. It was a sales job and I uh, sold everything from cars to insurance. And I just reached a point at uh, midlife and age 37, it was almost like a midlife crisis uh, where I didn't want to interact with humanity in that fashion anymore because I just looked at people like uh, a fresh cooked turkey leg. You know, how can I get their name on a signature so I can pay my mortgage this week? And I thought that there was uh, a deeper way to connect with humanity. So I at the age of 37, I signed up for as a non-traditional student and got a bachelor's degree in occupational therapy. And my plan was, uh, when I graduated in 1997, to work this second career and retire. And that's exactly what I did. I retired after 20 years in 2017. So I was able to meet the goal that I'd set for myself. And I was much happier in that 20-year period than I was in my sales career because straight commission is stressful. Every Sunday night, you're afraid you're going to blank that week. I never did, but I always had anxiety on Sunday night. And it's just nice to be able to do something you love and focus on that and have your paycheck be, you know, a byproduct of that. Well, I agree with you on that. I mean, all the times and years I was in broadcasting, you know, one of the most unstable jobs you could ever have. You never knew how long you were going to have a job at a radio station. Always, They were always looking for new blood, you know, especially, you know, to keep their radio station fresh. So you sit there and you knew you had a job for maybe a year or two and that's it. And I'll tell you, that really wears on you. Yeah, and sometimes uh, Americans in particular have kind of this bubble that they live in. You know, a lot of Americans perceive us as the most powerful influence in the world, but most of the humans living on the planet right now are East Asian. They speak Mandarin and English both. And take China, for example, they're run by about 75 people, many of whom have advanced engineering degrees. And as we speak, uh, they're building a particle accelerator similar to CERN, only twice as big. And um, their thought is that they'll be able to access parallel worlds with that. Uh, famous physicist David Deutsch said that, that uh, D-wave quantum computing and these particle colliders will actually allow us to ac access resources, whatever that means in these other dimensions, which the string theorists are saying is, you know, 10 or 11 dimensions. And also China's uh, building digital infrastructure in every continent on Earth as we speak. Uh, 5G is coming soon, and this will enable uh, things like scalar weapons and advanced holographics. And we're moving into an era of the Internet of Things where everything, all of your appliances, your refrigerator, your boat, your car is connected to the Internet. Even um, when we had our new furnace installed a couple of years ago, they asked if we wanted Wi-Fi in our furnace. And I said, why in the world would I want Wi-Fi in my furnace? And he says, well, some people, as they're driving home, they like to access the Internet and raise, you know, turn, turn the furnace on. And I said, well, no, I'm not ready for that. Well, I can say one disadvantage of everything going on, you know, the Internet. One of these days, you're going to go onto your computer or whatever device we have by then, and it might not work. I mean, just think about this. All it would take is one major solar flare, and it could take out a lot of the satellites. So, I mean, there all of a sudden, and not just a satellite, our grid system is so unstable, especially in this country. We seem to spend money like building a wall and all this other stuff when we could have actually been fixing our grid system. So one day, you know, I've, the society, I wonder what would happen, Russell, if one day you went and you couldn't get on the Internet, you couldn't access your credit cards, you couldn't access anything. Uh, I think it would be major chaos really fast. And that's what we're setting ourselves up for with the Internet. I mean, everything is tied into it. The banking system, you name it. You and I in our age bracket have a unique perspective because when I was 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, we collected bubblegum cards. I mean, that was our big thing. We didn't have any cell phones. Uh, we didn't text message anybody. In my graduating class of 1973, we had the equivalent of a no-frills uh, Facebook called a slam book, and you'd write your name on it, and you'd pass it all over the class, and everybody would tell you what they thought of you. Yeah. And it was really interesting to get your slam book back. So, I mean, to go from that real low-tech uh, environment and having a childhood with, you know, just – our favorite entertainment was riding our bicycles and following the mosquito trap down in Florida. And uh, now seeing young people, they're walking down the street. I saw some uh, somebody that worked at Walmart today 
pulling a pallet full of merchandise, staring at their iPhone. You know, so we're in a different world already. The young people are raised on laptops and tablets, and they know how to swipe and text. And I mean, that's their world. And so no telling how they're going to turn out, you know, as adults, whether they're going to be, some people think they're going to be socially stunted. And then other people just say that's the direction that humanity has gone. So they're the, they're the new type of human. That is scary. You know, I remember back, you know, before cell phones and all that stuff, you know, what used to really upset me, you come up to a traffic light and you see some woman, you know, combing her hair, putting her lipstick on, doing her eyelashes, you know, not paying attention when the light changes. Now you come up to a stoplight, you see everybody on their cell phone, not paying attention to the traffic light, rear ending people, you know, hitting guys on motorcycles because they're so involved in their cell phone. That's what I'm saying. If something happened where our grid system went down or we got hit with a solar flare where it took out the satellites, what would we do with no anything? I mean, a lot. Of, they, I don't think they could survive. Yeah, it, it just like they just stare at each other, you know. It's like, what do we do now? <laughs> Could you imagine? Yeah, but yeah it, that's Could, the world we're moving into, and it's uh, we're just on the precipice of what Ray Kurzweil t- talks in a, um, an intelligence explosion, a uh, exponential increase in technology, and nobody really knows where an exponential increase in technology will lead. We used to go by Moore's Law, where technology just doubled every year, and now we're going into, you know, this year it's doubled, the next year it doubles that, and the next year it doubles that, and uh, we don't know exactly where that's going to wind up. Well, it scares me. It really does how society is going. Again, could you imagine this? I'm going to, then we can move off the subject. The grid system goes down, or the satellite system goes down, internet goes down. Could you imagine how many people will be staring at their iPhones for hours and hours and hours, not knowing what to do? Yeah, I mean, just not even knowing what to do during the course of the day, because I, I swear to God, some people are so fixated on, on th- their phones, cell phones, and uh, playing video games. That's their whole entire life, it seems. And the strange thing is it continues into their 30s and 40s. Uh, and that's and 60s weird for me. and 70s. <laughs> I had to throw that in. I, I'll be honest with you. I was really bad about uh, a year ago of being on Facebook 24 7. We go out to dinner, right? My wife would look at me and my sons would say, What in the blank are you doing? And I said, Well, I, you know, I'm eating. No, you're not, Dad. You're on your cell phone. After getting harassed for a long period of time, I, I, I hardly get on it anymore. Yeah, you reach a point where you start out, you just like, like a, you dump, a uh, psychological dump. I got into flame wars, you know, 10 years ago where we were really mean to each other. And then that kind of subsided. And here lately, I've just been posting really kind of friendly, uplifting, generic stuff because I've heard every argument from every end of the spectrum politically and religiously to where I'm kind of weary with it, you know, and I just uh, I just like posting really positive stuff now. Wow, that's, so that's it. That- that's a learning curve in and of itself. Oh, it is. Now, I got to ask you, too, since the last time we talked, this disclosure is supposed to be hitting and, and people keep talking about, about UFOs. I really have not seen any major, major anything hit. I mean, yes, we have the Navy saying that they're taking reports on UFOs and somebody in Pentagon and a couple of congressmen or, and senators are interested. But I haven't seen this big thing it's supposed to came down about five months ago about disclosure you know it's a bombshell was going to drop have you noticed that or is this my imagination well it's an interesting step that the u.s navy uh confirmed that uaps unidentified aerial phenomena that uh, appear to be under intelligent control that we know we didn't build do exist that the u.s military does have encounters with these and there's lots of documented incidents like the 1976 Iranian encounter where they dispatched jets. And as the jets got close to the UAP, all their weapon systems shut down. Uh, one of them turned around and another one went and the same thing happened. It. So we've got a lot of documented incidents, but for a lot of people, that wasn't enough. And even this recent announcement, this little soft disclosure piece about the Tic Tac, uh, the Nimitz uh, incident in 2004, the real hardcore skeptics, you know, still say that isn't enough. 
And the community that I'm getting more and more deeply connected with are, are the real bona fide experiencers that have had encounters with non-human intelligence and craft. And they're the biggest skeptics of the government coming out with a disclosure because disclosure is happening every single day by non-human intelligence communicating and connecting with individuals and small groups of their choosing. And that community who've had actual experiences with non-human intelligence are very skeptical about anything coming from the government. And the subject and the phenomena is so complex that the real experiencers don't even know how that would even happen. I mean, how in the world a government official who probably has very limited knowledge of the UFO lore in the first place, you know, would come out and make a major announcement, hey, we're being visited by people from Andromeda or whatever, um, they're the most skeptical community, the, the ones that are actually having real encounters with, with uh, non-humans. Well, you know, I don't know if you listen to my show much, but I have had some people on here in the last couple of months that, you know, claim they were abducted by aliens. I've had people that had implants removed uh, from like Dr. Roger uh, Lear. Uh, you know, I it, it tells me something is going on. And what I find people as advanced as we think we are, they still have this thing in their mind. Unless they absolutely see it themselves, it doesn't exist. I can't believe with all the planets out there, the different solar systems and all this stuff and galaxies with that we're the only humanoids around. I, I, I just can't buy that. You know, that's like saying the, the earth is still flat. And if you take your ship and sail it out there, it's going to fall off. Uh, we got to open our eyes up and realize that something is going on. There's so many reports going on every day coming into the UFO reporting center or a couple other centers. You get these reports from very credible people that are seeing, you know, UFOs or being abducted. And, and it, it's scary. And, you know, the government should have, well, I think they blew it back in Roswell. You know, when they first said, oh, we, you know, we got wreckage of a UFO. And then the next day it was a weather balloon. Yeah, sure. Okay. Hey, okay. You know, it's a weather balloon. Yeah, I just, I, I think the government has it lied so long. I think they can't come, uh, come out and tell the truth now because I think they think that the, the population couldn't take it. Well, there's a lot of people that would react very poorly to it. Uh, Richard Dolan wrote that book, A.D., After Disclosure, and it goes into great detail about some of the possible societal uh, repercussions of uh, a major government announcement like that. But Leslie Keene's book, UFOs, you know, government officials and pilots go on record. I mean, that's an excellent. Even uh, Michio Kaku, who's a theoretical physicist, is on board with that. He says it's the closest thing to the smoking gun uh, that we have. But that smoking gun... Um, I'm skeptical that even if that happened, you know, say a current president brought an alien gray out on television and you'd have a whole social faction that said it was CGI, that wouldn't even be good enough. So um, I've got friends who consider themselves hardcore scientists, and when I start uh, talking about UFOs or cryptids, they just throw up their arms and say, I'm a scientist, you know, and they, they are completely unaware that many scientists are also state directors of MUFON, uh, like Dr. Jacques Vallée, you know, he's one of the major contributors to the scientific angle of the UAP phenomena. And they don't seem to be aware because they've never, they, they assume it's not real. So they've never even cracked the first book on UFOs. And when I started doing that back after 09, after my NDE, I, I was shocked about how much really good information is available at your local library, you know, in, in the public domain. There's excellent material in the public domain. And there's just as much information in the public domain to conclude that UFOs are real as what they expect in a court of law uh, when they might even send somebody to the electric chair. You know, it's eyewitness testimony, circumstantial evidence, and group consensus, you know, and they're expected to come to a decision about somebody's life or death. But when it comes to UFOs and cryptids and things of the paranormal nature, uh, there's like an extra layer of evidence that needs to happen. And that in and of itself is not scientific. Oh, yeah. You know, last night I had Joe Taylor on. Now, he's the guy who, you know, goes out and, you know, uh, goes out and looks for dinosaur bones. Uh, he repairs them from museums and does all that stuff. We were talking about, you know, cryptics last night. And, you know, like the Thunderbird, okay, there's still a lot of scientists that say that Thunderbird could exist. Then you got a group of scientists that says, no, there's no way, you know, because you would see it. Well, you know what? I don't, I don't think you're going to go see it looking for it. 
I think it's the yeah. type of thing it, it, somebody's going to see it accidentally. And you never know, that person that might actually see it might be, well, put it this way. Could- 